everyone, my name is James Williams and welcome to a mobile mobile ecosystem forum live webinar. I come to you from the north of England and I'm joined today by various people from around the world, but principally the UK at the moment. I'm joined by Neil Downing from TMT Analysis, Mike Round, who is with the Mobile Ecosystem Forum, Stuart Mitchell from Celesis, Mio Soldine from Infobit and hopefully someone else coming along but i'll keep that surprise till a little bit later so without much further ado before i introduce the topic let's introduce you to the panelists neil if we can start with yourself please you could introduce yourself and your company of course thank you thank james you. Uh, good afternoon everybody to everyone listening. Uh, my name is Neil Downing and I am VP of product for a company called TMT Analysis. TMT Analysis started life as a number portability lookup provider. So uh, one of these people who helps to navigate the maze of complexity around number portability across the world, dealing with operators and regulators to bring in data as users move networks and storing that data and providing that as a lookup service for our customers the carriers and message hubs of this world for example who use that to accurately route calls and sms messages beyond that uh, we about 18 months ago started to extend our product set and our capabilities into the worlds of mobile identity and fraud prevention using that telco knowledge and experience to bring what is i think we'd all agree very valuable data that exists in the mobile operator landscape to a, a much wider audience and a wider range of use cases so that's really my focus within the company to help develop that product and move it forward so it's great to be here today to talk about how onboarding is going to work going forward thank you no problem thank you neil and over to you mio Hi, hello. hello, good afternoon to everybody. Thanks for um, having uh, me uh, today, uh, James. Uh, so my name is Mio Soldin. I'm Director of Strategy and Operator Partnership in InfoWip. And um, so InfoWip is a global communication platform as a service provider. And uh, we operate basically in the whole world. So our coverage is uh, just a little bit over 200 uh, countries uh, in the world. Uh, I'm foc focusing uh, in uh, info uh, toward mobile network operators. So we are about to work with uh, more than 650 operators in the world. And in this space, we are working um, with operators and for the operators. So from one side, we enable operators to um, monetize their assets and products. And on the other side, we help operators uh, to grow and, and build uh, and enhance their, their portfolio. Uh, toward the client side as well, we are trying to be this bridge between the market demand uh, businesses and uh, help them uh, communicate with their customers. And of course, using our leverage and uh, partnership with this vast number of uh, mobile network operators. In terms of uh, portfolio, uh, of course, our strongest point is our uh, omnichannel and, and CPAS. And the um, last two years, we are entering into the SaaS portfolio <clears throat> where we are trying to build um, uh, on top of our um, omnichannel and, and CPAS uh, range of products uh, for communication like contact centers, like mobile identity, um, uh, like enga customer engagement platforms and stuff like this, which will like circle our, our portfolio and offering for the operators as well as or, or for the businesses, our clients. And don't forget the consumers, because all these services are for us at the end of the day, and this is what we're here about today. Exactly. So Stuart, over to yourself. Thank you, Mio. Um, hi, I'm Stuart. Um, I'm currently working with uh, Celesis in a product management capacity. Um, Celesis provide a number of solutions to mobile operators, primarily um, looking at anti-fraud solutions um, around SMS firewalls, things like that. Um, a number of security services as well, signaling firewalling, um, and some broadband analytics as well. Um, the thing about Celesis headquartered in Dublin, Ireland, is we also um, have a side offshoot that I'm working with as well, uh, which is based around IoT um, and providing uh, secure IoT sims. 
Thank you. Yeah, you've been a regular attendee, I think, on MEF webinars lately. So good I'll to have you back. I'll keep it brief. I'll keep it brief. Good, good to be back, sir. And last but absolutely by no means least at the moment, Mr. Mike Round, MEF Project Director. Go for it, Mike. Introduce yourself. Yeah, hi there. Uh, my name is Mike Rounds, uh, and as James said, I'm the uh, Project Director at MEF. Um, my primary responsibility at the moment, though, is as the Independent Secretariat for the SMS Protection Registry project that we've been running for a couple of a uh, couple of years now, just entering our third year. So, so that's really my prime uh, prime role within MEF. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I know you've got some fantastic members there, including government agencies and things like that. So. I think people are starting to really switch on that. The topic we're about to discuss impacts all of us. So the topic at hand, quite simply, 2020 has not exactly been the year most of us would have expected in any way, shape or form. Now, digital transformation is a topic that has really been banded about so much in the past three to five years, but actually it really started 30 years ago when businesses started to computerize more things, to create databases, stored more data. That started 30 years ago. But digital transformation is now no longer just a nice to have. And the situation today is that so many people who really hadn't been in the online digital world before, have now been forced unceremoniously and to an extent with some people kicking and screaming into the online world and with that have come a serious amount of challenges and we're not just talking the UK here our discussion today is truly global and we've got representatives here who have a very global perspective and today I really want a nice open discussion so I'd just like to start with Stuart today. Where are we in 2020 with regards to client engagement? Because last year, looking, at, looking forward, the channels we would be using, how businesses would be engaging with customers, et cetera, what's actually happened this year? I don't think a lot has changed this year. Um, there's still a lot of talk about you know, the rise and growth of RCS. Um, I'm an Apple iPhone user, so I've never received an RCS message. Um, but, um, you know, still we see uh, dominance of uh, HP messaging, uh, in particular on the mobile side. Um, still is ruling as, as, as king uh, of the castle. Um, unfortunately, we've also seen a massive growth in um, phishing uh, attacks over SMS, which is a particular focus of mine. We'll probably talk about that a little bit later. But... Um, I mean, 2020 compared to 2020, 2019 is, is probably pretty similar, I would say. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Mike, because you manage the UK Sender ID registry. So the members of that registry are varied. You've got banks, you've got government agencies, you've got large messaging companies in there, you've got a whole variety of players in there. What have your, your members essentially seen this year? Have they seen a big increase in the amount of threats coming out in line with this increase in HTTP SMS volumes? What's, what's happening out there in the market? Obviously, you're speaking from a UK perspective with the UK sender. Register. Yeah. Well, I, if I just outline what we've been doing with the Yeah, please do. Thank that you. And that'll probably tease out some of the, some of the answers, really. I think, um, so for those that sort of, you know, don't know really, uh, for the last couple of years now, we've been running a, um, uh, an SMS protection registry project, which is clearly an anti-fraud uh, initiative. Um, the objective of, uh, of, that, uh, of that project was to significantly reduce the impact of A to B, uh, A to P smishing on consumers. Um, you know, customers who get caught out by smishing attacks usually end up losing on average 3,800 to 6,000 pounds. Uh, but typically it's everything they've got in their bank account is what the feedback that I get from the banks. It's not, you know, it's not necessarily limited to an amount. Uh, I did hear um, from one bank that they told me that they were dealing with the case that someone that lost half a million quid. Um, so it does vary, the, the impact varies dramatically. But in, in terms of um, risks to consumers, um, the the attack vectors, I think, really are, are via direct spoofing of genuine sender IDs. So um, that's you know where a fraudster duplicates a genuine sender ID um, and, uh, and and sends and starts sending messages. If you're you know if you've got a smartphone, obviously, and you happen to be a customer of that bank, if it is a bank, 
then your smartphone will very conveniently put those fraudulent messages into conversation threads with the genuine message. So it makes it virtually impossible for consumers to, to know the genuine ones from, uh, from the fraudulent ones. And also, uh, the next level of um, uh, attack really is via impersonation, which is the, the misspellings of genuine sender IDs. So we try within the registry to, to reduce the attack surfaces by um, uh, from direct spoofing and impersonation. And we try, we, what we're trying to do is move the threat, the threat level down from direct spoofing through impersonation. Inevitably, it ends up in long number solutions and SIM farms, uh, which are generally a peer-to-peer -peer solution, uh, peer-to-peer uh, issue. And the solution that we've got is a collaboration between um, the merchants um, under UK finance, uh, aggregators, MNOs, uh, and it's heavily supported by National Cyber Security Centre. We're, um, we're just entering our third year now. Um, so uh, I'm just sort of going around at the moment, uh, re-signing all, uh, all the existing merchants, uh, and they've all agreed to re-sign, which is good. Um, but it's worth saying that the solution that we have at the moment, uh, the registry solution is not a peer-to-peer -peer solution for SIM farm phishings, uh, phishing, so it, it is focused purely on A2P through the aggregator channels. And in terms of the way that it, it works, um, we, we collate genuine sender IDs that the merchants used and we, we, we put those into a, a protected list um, which is monitored um, and via, via the aggregator community who provide us traffic reports. We also collate variants of the genuine sender IDs used, um, via the merchants uh, in, in the form of denied lists uh, and we request blocking for those uh, via the aggregators again. It's all permissions based uh, and it's a very very light touch solution. Uh, I should emphasize that it's um, uh, there are you know there are plenty of other types of solution out there um, that needs you know quite a bit of integration but what we've done um, it doesn't require any sort of software integration by the MNOs, the banks, or the aggregators. So from that perspective, it's quite easy to get up and running quite quickly. Um, and as I think, as you said earlier, James, I mean, we've, um, in terms of the participants, we've got uh, five government agencies now who are part of the project, which include HMRC, the DBLA, um, the Cabinet Office, um, NHS and TV licensing. And there's about a dozen major banks and retailers so we're covering about 50 brands because there's a lot of sub brands associated there as well um, with about 20 aggregators and four MNOs. Um, and if I just, uh, just to sort of tie up on that really, in terms of protected sender IDs, there's about 240 protected sender IDs currently on the, on the registry and about a thousand denied ones uh, and about 2,000 chains um, that sits uh, that sit in, within the registry that we're we're monitoring at the moment. Mike, anyone anyone would think you're trying to sell this proposition to other countries around the world as well. That was very good. <laughs> well, we're trying hard. Yeah, yeah we, have, uh, we have had uh, interest, and we are talking to a number of uh, excellent a number of other territories as well. Now, over to you, Mio. With your global view, as you said, you manage. You personally manage the carrier relations team at Infobip. You've got relations with 650 operators around the world. So it gives you a real global perspective. <laughs> Are there any parts of the world where you see more threats than others? So to be particularly sensitive in this domain where the average person on the street is being bombarded with spam, potential smishing attacks, et cetera, et cetera, more than other countries. What breakdown do you see? Well, James, thank you. Well, uh, what I can tell you is uh, definitely there is no market that is, uh, you know, protected from at least this kind of tries. And is uh, very uh, correctly said this year did bring quite a lot of change in this space. So I would put it like this, uh, you know, how tremendous number of new people were pushed into this digitalization, regardless if they are willing to do so or not from the consumer perspective. It actually gives like a nice new addressable market for the guys who are really trying to do all these dodgy stuff, uh, frauds and phishings and uh, all these other techniques. And <clears throat> the problem is so far that uh, what I think is the, the things changed too rapidly. So, so far this digitalization was kind of going um, 
balanced way. So, you know, the, the technology was developing, the consumers were educated how it goes, the ecosystem was growing together with it and, and you know, trying to protect it as much as, as it can. What happened now is like basically in a, any given market in a two, three weeks, we practically digitalized, which is great and great from perspective of our business. And, and we see like a, quite a significant growth in this one. But unfortunately, a lot of people that were not used to, you know, the, the, uh, these kind of use cases and using the technology this way were actually exposed and forced to use some uh, technology and smartphones for like basic daily, uh, you know, tasks that they used to like either go to shop or like buy or whatever, you know, do some uh, other stuff. So the thing is they're, as a consumers, not protected in terms of education and what they are allowed to do or not, or what kind of, you know, uh, techniques of attack it is. On the other hand, <clears throat> not all ecosystems are equally protected. So um, as you say, some parts of the world are, you know, uh, maybe a bit more advanced. Uh, from my point of view, it's part of the motivation. So how the system is motivated to protect uh, it or not. Sometimes it can be like, you know, government driven, especially in some, uh, you know, centralized countries and, and countries where more, <clears throat> you know, like the government is dictating the, the situation. And here we have examples, I can just name, for example, India, where, you know, uh, they are starting with this, you know, the project where, you know, all the messages will be, you know, scanned and go through a system. Uh, I mean, technology is there. So we now have a blockchain, we have IE, machine learning. So it's not a problem, can we do it? And of course, there are gentlemen here together with me with companies that are working on different aspects of this technology. Uh, that it's a question of, of motivation. Sometimes this motivation comes from the business side and, and maybe monetization can be uh, one, one push. On, on the markets where we don't have like a strong motivating factor from any of the side, here it goes a bit slower. And then we see like increasing uh, number of, of fraud. Uh, this can be also motivating factor because you know, if you have like this lot of headlines and people complaining and, and the cases which, which Mike uh, just pointed out. I think out, that's I think. it, these headlines are important for Mike can just mention yeah. an example where someone's yeah. potentially on the hook for 500,000 pounds if they're draining the savings of someone who doesn't have much, that's what gets the attention. Yes, but yes. Those yes. particular types of fraud may not happen so much, but it's what drives the, the media attention is truly important. And it could be positive for us working across the ecosystem, but then again, it can take the attention away from the real areas that are creating the problems. So Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. You're right. I mean, this media uh, attention is important in this reactive mode. So, you know, somewhere we can act more proactively. If on the market there is no this driven force uh, or, or joint force to, to have it proactively protected, then this reactive force is acting as, as these headlines that you are mentioning or these you know, crazy numbers. And, and then you know, banks are also going into like, you know, for, from the bank's perspective, it's just you know, they have their fraud budget. And as, as long as you are within it, you know, they don't invest much. As soon as like fraud comes above this fraud budget, then they start acting and, and then they are very, very active in this way. Mia, so I'm going to bring Neil in at this sure. place because you had a little wry smile on your face when Mia right. was talking about that with banks. I know that broad budget banks, this type of vertical, it's very much where your company plays in. So, uh, Well, I mean, the, the, the reason for the wry smile was, was uh, funnily enough, your original question was uh, what's changed over yeah. the, the last year. And... Only this morning I was talking to a, a global tier one bank, funnily enough, and what they told me was in Asia, they've had a huge increase in phone related uh, problems because of the advent of track and trace and people leaving their phone numbers in more and more places and allowing people to compile lists of active phone numbers. I, I um, won't bring Stuart in right now, but I'm sure he's got something to say on that. <laughs> if, if you've been looking at his LinkedIn posts, no, no hold back Stuart, You'll, we'll come to you, don't worry. Carry on. But, but yeah, I mean, you know, that was a, a real world example from a, a real world bank of, of what they're seeing. And I think the, the point that you were making about uh, digital transformation, I mean, you, of course, you're exactly right. Transformation and what we now call digital transformation have been around for a very long time. 
but this whole process of onboarding customers has had to change this year for many organizations and it's had to change at a, a pace that didn't necessarily suit their original needs and objectives you know the idea of wandering into a, a bank with a copy of your electricity bill in your hand yeah. Uh, isn't very COVID safe and so uh, organizations that were thinking they might have uh, a few years to embrace this kind of uh, seismic change in how they do things uh, have had to do it a hell of a lot quicker than that and that was your point I think Mijo as well that actually some of them have been either left behind or have gone too far because they've thrown time and energy at it in a hurry because they've, they've had no other choice. Well, exactly it. It, it. They have had no other choice. But those of you who will know me around the industry, I, I always talk about the same things. You could have the best technical solution going. But if you haven't got the basics right and taken a step back, thought about the processes and procedures around it, you miss everything. And this is where I'm going to bring Stuart back in. I know if you're looking at his LinkedIn posts, giving some great examples of real life smishing attempts, et cetera, et cetera. And I think quite a few of them originate from a local Facebook group you have. And just mentioned the count, the council, I think, or the, your local council putting their number out for everyone. Yeah. I mean, when you start looking for this stuff, it's crazy how much is out there. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the local council. The local council um, launched a, a, a contact track and trace system recently and they sent out a communique to all the residents uh, where I live and said um, you know we'll reach out to you uh, if, if we if we if we need you to self-isolate and you'll know it's us calling because we'll be calling from this number um, yeah you got it Neil um, at a time when any number can be spoofed and then they went on to say and don't worry we'll also text you <laughs> without saying how they were going to text you so I actually wrote to my counselor and said do you understand what this means you're actually training your residents to accept a, a system that can be very easily spoofed. Anyone can use that number to make a fake call. Anyone can send a, a text message, even from their phone, to say, oh, hey, you know, this is the contact tracing system. Our system's currently down. Um, so we're using this number, but we just called you a second ago. And, um, you know, you need to pay for a, a test now. Please put your bank details in here. So simple. Uh, I'm not even a criminal. I've been running this campaign that, uh, that, that uh, just to finish that story off, actually, having got hold of the council, they quickly understood that I knew what I was talking about. They changed all their communications. They're going to put a free phone number in place so that if people do have any concerns, they can actually Great. call in free of charge, yeah. um, which is something I suggested, so that you know there is kind of a, a loop back on that. Um, but yes, yeah, so I've been running this campaign um, about smishing. It's based around a product that we recently launched. I won't bore you with the product details. It's all on the website. You can come and have a look. But um, what I've picked up, it kind of started really as a name and shame campaign. You know, I'm sick and tired of people I know and myself and my family receiving phishing messages coming from long numbers. I think, you know, the work that Mike has done in the UK has pushed, all that phishing is still happening. Uh, it's just been pushed onto long codes. So, you know, great initiative, fantastic job. Um, kind of delegitimized um, fake sender IDs, which is fantastic, first step, but the problem hasn't gone away. In fact, I think the problem's actually got worse. Anecdotally, you know, I see way more fishing now than I ever did before. So um, I've, I've had people sending me in messages. And as I say, it started as a name and shame campaign um, against the MNOs that are allowing their, their sims to be used in these sim boxes. You know, it's very easy to see the sender ID, do a look up, find out which number it is, um, and, and call them out on that. As I've gone further on down the, um, you know, sort of a, most, most days I do a post on this basis. People send me in messages and, and uh, frankly, from around the world, I'd like to receive some messages. I've got a lot of UK, I've got a lot of Netherlands, got quite a lot from Malaysia, I'd like others from around the world. But as I go on, I'm learning more and more about this, of course. So what I'm seeing now is that the, the URLs that people are using in their phishing messages are often registered on the same day that the messages are sent out. So no system that just looks up known bad links is ever gonna catch them. Um, it's all brand new. Um, the, the free website builders are freely allowing people to go and build um, fake websites um, without any checks and balances. Um, so, you know, it's a multi number of things. It's not just the mobile operators are at fault here, if you like. You know, the, the registrars are letting anyone create a domain, which is clearly fake. The, um, I mean, one registrar in particular, um, I have to say, nearly always comes up, but then they are the cheapest. Um, 
you know, the free website builder is allowing anyone to go ahead and create a fake website um, that looks, to all intents and purposes, from a cursory glance, if it, from an untrained eye, like the, the original host site. Um, that's an issue that needs to be addressed. And all of this is, is really kind of preying on people who aren't that tech literate, will see a very urgent call to action in a message um, and really feel that they're encouraged to do it. You know, my parents have been caught in the past with um, an automated call scan. Someone called them up and told them their, their PC was infected. I just happened to call them 20 minutes later and they said, oh, I'm so glad you called. They just called to say our PC is infected and they've been dialing into our machine and they helped me set up a PayPal account. I was like, holy moly. It took a while to clear it all up, but I got there just in time. So, you know, I've got personal experience in this. Um, I'm receiving these phishing messages now almost on a monthly basis, and I'm sure everyone else is too. What's really interesting to me is that mobile operators themselves seem to be the most commonly phished or attempted to, uh, to be phished entities. I'm not quite sure yet why that is. And I'd love some insight from the panel, but from, from people on the call, if you've got any ideas around that. But um, with that in mind, I don't really understand why the mobile operators aren't being more active in this space. Thank you, Stuart. Anyone on the panel can share any insight or just ideas or suppositions would be great. I, I guess from my perspective, um, I, I, I share, Stuart, I share your, uh, your, your thoughts on, you know, the MNOs. I think there's, there's, there's a lot more they can do. Clearly, uh, fraudsters are getting these SIMs, um, you know, in bulk from, um, you know, from dealers. Uh, and, you know, the, the MNOs don't seem to be showing a huge amount of responsibility on tracking down where this is happening, you know, it's happening in huge quantities. They should be, you know, they could quite easily look to see where uh, where they're coming from. They could also quite easily look to see the locations where they're being activated as well, uh, because obviously they're going to be low, they're, they're going to be activated on the same sector and same cell in most cases. Um, and things like checking the IMEIs of the SIM boxes as well. Um, I know that, you know, the, the SIM boxes have come on a long way now. The 500 pounds you buy, you pay for a 32 channel box on eBay. Um, you can get them now with uh, configurable um, IMEI, so you can cycle that constantly as well, which is what they're doing. But I do think that the MNOs have got, um, you know, there's, there's a lot more that they can do. It's not entirely uh, their problem, but there's a huge amount more they could do. But one of the biggest issues I think that we've got with the MNOs is that the consumer teams don't talk to the wholesale teams. So you've got a consumer team who are just solely focused on, on you know, how many, how many SIMs can we shift? Um, and then you've got the, the wholesale team on the other side who are, who are picking up the pieces from a, a, a damaged um, a wholesale business. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any, any link. I know that from first hand, um, but you know, there doesn't, they, you know, I think these are some very, very basic things that they could do to significantly reduce the problem. And I think with a lot of these things, certainly with the registry, and I think it's probably not a lot different with, with sim farms, that you don't have to be 100% effective. I think all you need to do is to be effective enough to make the fraudsters change their behavior. That's, that's all you kind of need to do, really. But certainly with the registry, you know, if you can, if you can make the fraudsters sort of you know, target something else, like, okay, so like we've done with um, you know, direct spoofing and impersonation, yes, it's moved it down to sim farms, but you know, likewise, it, it doesn't have to be 100% effective. All you've got to do is get the fraudsters to, to move on to some other lower hanging fruit. Um, and then, you know, that's, that's probably good enough for the time being. You don't necessarily need a, uh, a massively complicated solution. Um, but certainly on sim farms, I think collectively the industry needs to hold the network's um, feet to the fire a little bit more. Certainly I've been talking to the, to the networks about this and a number of other issues. Um, and uh, and asking for support via mobile UK as well, because when I talk to the banks, you know they're seeing now that from the effectiveness of the registry, they're saying, yeah, okay, great, but now we've got all these problems with sim farms. So, you know, there is an expect hope and expectation that um, the network's going to step up a little bit. Thank you. So, Mick, just, Mick, James, can I just touch on something very very quickly? Um, go for obviously, it. two two parties on the sim box thing there, Mike, is the originating network. Um, but also the, the terminating network. Um, doesn't seem to be any um, effective control on inbound um, SIM farm messages either. Mm. Thank you, Stuart. Mio, so your company as well as Stuart, Celesis, I know are heavily involved in the world of SMS firewalls, anti-spam, mm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I personally 
for the past seven years with my work have worked very closely with mobile operators to help them monetize their inbound ATP transactions, hopefully eliminate spam, fraud attempts, et cetera, et cetera, along the way. And it's not easy. Do you see mobile operators around the world now? And again, if there are differences across the regions, please let us know. But do you see them finally waking up and realizing, yes, checkbox, we need an SMS firewall. Checkbox, we need a signaling firewall, all with a good managed service, of course, because a firewall is nothing without a good managed service. Are they waking up? Well, uh, it's, it's um, I would put it like this, waking up started, but we are not, not there yet. And obviously by, by all these examples, uh, Stuart and Mike and, and others are pointing out. So <clears throat> it's true, mobile op uh, network operators are the key. They are not the only one, but they are very, very important part of the equation of the solution. Um, let, let's, uh, I, I, I will give them some credit now um, because you know, the, uh, in this COVID situation, we saw how crucial the role they played in you know, enabling the communication, quickly get up to speed, uh, changing themselves internally to be able to, to help and, 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 and support this change what was going on, which gives me kind of a hope that you know, this change within the MNO mindset is possible. Uh, okay, this, this event this year with the COVID was a kind of a bit extreme uh, motivating factor, but the thing is it, it can be changed. Definitely without uh, MNOs, we cannot uh, do it. Um, there are a couple of things which, which they can do uh, to be faster and, and depending on the market they play, you know, they, they will have to maybe push harder either on the regulatory side, either talking to each other, uh, maybe uh, listening more of the partner ecosystem. I mean, there are companies here and, and, and a few more out there that can help them in, in, in a couple of aspects. Uh, this uh, fraud and security is a complex topic. But uh, I think Mike pointed out very well, there are some uh, very, uh, you know, uh, low hanging fruits that we can easily solve. And even with this one, we would move uh, much faster in this, you know, uh, end goal of protect protecting our customers. Uh, then we can tickle out these this more complex things. Unfortunately, I think I read uh, some of the data and, and, and it's not recent, but maybe a few months ago, uh, that we last year reached only 50% of the network that are, somehow protected which is really really strange number i i was like really double checking it is, is it so true which means that there is like you know almost half of the world still not protected and from there applies the fact it's which Stuart was pointing out you know there is so many originating networks that are unprotected and they, they are just you know using it and and this market of fraud is growing as fast as the, the whole digitalization so yeah, uh, the, the key relies in, in MNOs, like really like, you know, being more active and all of us here to, to help them to support, to, to, to get in, into this. Exactly, so I don't want this to turn into an MNO bashing session. It absolutely yeah, yeah. is not because they're doing a sterling job. They've got a huge amount to do at the moment. But Neil, I, I'm aware that your company, TMT Analysis, you power the accurate routing of a lot of A to P SMS for aggregators globally, of course. So you have the number with yep. the number side of things, but also I think you're also working on the verification authentication side of things, helping people and companies, enterprises, whomever it may be, to ascertain that someone is who they say they are. And ideally to do that, information directly from mobile operators. So for example, knowing that I've been served by, James has been served by three for the past three years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's paid his bill every month on time, all these extra little nuggets of information are highly useful. Are, from your perspective and TMT analysis perspective, are, are mobile operators waking up to the opportunity? It's okay. It's all right, yeah. that was a hoax call, probably trying to sell me something. Or... No problem, there we go. <laughs> or, 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 or trying to take over my account and get me to set up a <laughs> PayPal account, or that, that's generally the only reason the house phone rings these days. At this right? time I, of day, I'm not joking. I, Absolutely, that is that is. You are you are not alone when the fixed line happens. So there we go. You are yeah, uh, safe. You weren't safe by the bell. You could have been uh, endangered by the bell. Absolutely. Going so back to my question. So are yes. the operators waking up to these opportunities that they can actually help protect their subscribers by sharing in a responsible way 
with companies such as yourselves extra information which will help validate transactions identity etc do they understand that or is there still real right so, yeah so I, mean, I completely get your sentiment that we don't want to turn this into a, a, a network operator bashing session because you know we're due to finish in 20 minutes and it could go on for hours if we did that i mean i, I suppose my uh my my personal view is of course i would almost be provocative and say since when did the operator community ever really band together to fight fraud right i mean if we go back to before mobile operators with telcos and fixed line telephony fraud which has been around for decades cbx fraud i was right and and well, yeah and the operators could have been at the forefront of dealing with it and they didn't and they haven't and it's still out there. So, you know, I, I do sort of feel that, that this is more status quo really. Um, but your point on what are they doing about it now? Well, there has been some changes there, right? And if you look at some countries, operators are starting to see uh, the power that their own data has in preventing downstream fraud by tying uh, mobile phone numbers to individuals and to information around them. And those are the kind of services that we're offering. So if you look here in the UK, all of the four main operators have a service available that you can take an API from them and you can get information like uh, date of last SIM change against that number, date of last device change, uh, you, you can get call forwarding, whether call forwarding is enabled in the network or not. And you can match uh, date, and, uh, date of birth, name and address against a phone number. So, you know, to stay on, apologies if you all know all about this, but the, um, the best way to stay on the right side of GDPR regulations here is to have that kind of match service. So as the customer of the service, whether you're a bank or a, just an end brand, you already give the mobile operator the number, the name and the address, and they confirm whether they match with the mobile operator's records. And I do see a lot of signs that the operators in sort of the more developed world are seeing this as an opportunity to try and provide additional protection for their consumers, their subscribers, that they're offering this kind of service, so they're less likely to uh, get, um, get spammed. But the, um, there's also this question that the mobile operators often fall foul of, of how to monetize that data that they have and then where that sits in this thing that Mike mentioned this, you know, between wholesale and retail. And of course, they're doing what they often struggle to do, which is also work together. So, you know, in, let's pick a country, let's pick uh, France. So France is a good example where uh, SFR, Orange and Bouygues all work together to offer more or less a common service. Uh, Canada is another good example where Rogers, Bell, Canada and TELUS work together to offer a largely uh, uniform service. But in most other countries, it's not. One operator does it, two don't. They do it and they offer different things and different parameters and different ways of doing things. So on the one hand, that creates an opportunity for people like us, which is great. So I'm not knocking it. But on the other, it's, it's going to limit adoption because uh, you're only going to go into a market and try and do these advanced levels of checks if you're covering at least, well, 60, 70 percent of the, the subscribers. So there is a huge amount more effort there. And I, in my opinion, it's definitely something that organisations like MEF, organisations like the GSMA could also take more of an active role in to try and bring a bit more structure and standardisation to this. Because for sure, what, what do we know about our mobile phone numbers? We know we keep them a really long time, probably in many cases longer than we keep our names. <laughs> so um, uh, in terms of an anchor point around our identity, it's hugely important. And we also know that the generation of people that are coming after us are not easily identifiable by many of the traditional means that we've all used. So in terms of identity and history and things like that, mobile uh, phone numbers and information about that 
is going to be a key thing for that generation, just as key as how long they've had a uh, Twitter account or a WhatsApp messenger account or something similar as being something that's going to be very valuable in the future to, to help understand who they are. So that data is, is fundamental and there is a real opportunity, which I hope that the mobile industry doesn't miss to actually get involved in that and help shape how it works. Stuart, I'd like to come to you because if we talk about regulation, let's say within the EU, you've got GDPR, you've got the Payment Services Directive 2, which officially comes into force at the end of the, this year with big penalties for companies that are doing business and don't adhere to it, they will get whacked with big financial penalties. Now, the idea of all this regulation, particularly GDPR, is to protect us, the consumer, the subscribers. Where do you see GDPR, though, in terms of mobile operators, enterprises, etc.? Could you actually say that GDPR is hindering preventing fraud, etc.? Because the easy get out for a lot of organizations is just to say no to something that one of your companies would suggest because of GDPR. GDPR is a good get out to say no because there's uncertainty about what information can and cannot be shared. We have had that um, very objection raised by some of the prospects and customers that we've spoken to. Um, you know, um, we provide a service that um, manipulates SMS messages to um, indicate whether they're verified or potentially dangerous. And um, operators come back and said, oh, you know, can't read SMS messages, GDPR. Um, which is effectively washing their hands and saying, you know, because of GDPR, we are just a dumb pipe. We are just going to stay out of the way. Um, this is not an MNO bashing session, but I think MNOs have got a unique ability mm -hmm. of actually, if they properly secure and understand the loopholes in the networks and, and shut them down, they've got this ability of becoming the most trusted channel. You know, email is a busted flush. No one trusts an email they get anymore. Um, you get false positives, you get, you know, have you checked your junk folder? It's probably gone there. We all hear it. Um, but the text message that comes to your phone on a properly protected network could be the most valuable commodity because it, it's, it's got that tr layer of trust um, layered on top of, you know, the delivery mechanism. Yeah. How do you, in an organization like Infobit and your team, your carry team globally, how do you go about getting the message across literally to mobile operators that actually there is a real opportunity to secure and clean the channels for their subscribers and essentially improve their brand standing even more. Add customer relationship, I don't like using this word too much, but customer relationship stickiness even more just by understanding this and getting their heads around what's possible. Because I know companies here on the panel understand GDPR to the nth degree, they know what is and isn't allowed, but how do you get it over the line with them and educate them? Yeah, exactly. You, you use now at the end the right word. So, so, so basically, <clears throat> last more than a year, um, our job was education. <laughs> so pretty much, you know, we, we put aside the sales pitch and, and everything what, what Neil was describing and, and, and showing the MNOs that they're actually lying on the gold lake of uh, this data. And, and th then it calls this education, 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 <clears throat> you know, what actually this means, how they fit into the whole picture and, and trying to, <clears throat> uh, from one side, provoke them not to miss this train because, you know, there is a like real threat for the MNOs to, to, to lose the pace uh, because, you know, problem will find their way out. You know, one way or another, there are other means, and you know, other companies are doing, you know, different things to get on into this uh, on top of the fraud and stuff. So what we are trying to talk to to do M and O's and and educate in a way that you know, on one side there is a unique opportunity, and they are really in a position and still are in a position to play important key role for the solution. On the other hand, it can be like a solution for their own issues like you know generating a new revenue streams um, changing their brand and and, and maybe you know <clears throat> like uh, you know uh, like moving away from this you know all traditional thinking about the mnos and big pipe and everything that you said um, uh, there are different reasons and and we can think about you know all kinds of reasons why not to do some things so so the the the, the real point is uh, how to you know push them to do 
to, to, to take some action. Uh, usually what we've seen is uh, this, they, you know, very quickly, quickly appreciate the reasoning and understand all this. But then there is, you know, many internal reasons and, and, you know, competing with other projects like 5G, like IoT, like something like this. And then it's, it is hard to get tension on, on, on all this stuff. Uh, again, I think, you know, uh, all of us as an ecosystem can help them, you know, grow fast into these technologies. And actually, one of part of the education is actually showing MNOs that some of the things are not that hard either resource-wise or time-wise and stuff like this. It's just, you know, that, you know, uh, if they understand it, how, how it should be done and, and you know, lead them, then, then it's, it's really not that, that uh, hard to do it. So, uh, yeah, of course, showing them the potential in terms of monetization and revenue, it helps, but unfortunately, it's not the only thing that, that it's, that it's uh, you know, that it helps. I think I think it, real life examples help, and if you have a mobile operator that has done this and been through this and done it successfully, they're the best poster child, so to speak, mm -hmm. to actually teach other mobile operators. Yes, we did this, mm -hmm. and it's absolutely worth it in terms of so many things. Now, mm -hmm. Mike, I know with the UK sender registry ID and other things, there's the issue though of a problem. There's a problem here because. There are lots of companies out there who we know this is an industry-wide problem. We know these are global issues impacting subscribers all around the world. But companies don't like sticking their hand up and saying, actually, I've got a problem. I need to solve it. How, how do you, from your UK perspective with the sender registry ID, how do your members go about pushing the education aspect? And are they, are they trying to get the wording here, but they, are they understanding the fact that actually they've got to come out and say, yes, there is an issue, we've got to address it together and combat it and essentially remove it? Because Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because um, the, talking, to, talking to the merchants, um, you know, the experiences differ enormously. Um, and I, I spend a lot of time obviously talking to the fraud and security teams. To be quite honest, a lot of the merchants don't know what they should be worried about. Um, they, uh, they, they obviously have complaints. They have lots of complaints into their customer service teams. Uh, I think there's issues there because their customer service teams aren't always educated to, to ask the right questions of consumers when they phone in. Um, and, you know, clearly if you've just been fished and you call your bank, then you're going to be under a lot of pressure, but actually having proper scripts and, and being, been educated properly to ask the right questions so that the information can be gathered. Certainly if we're talking about sender IDs and things like that, you know, a lot of that, the nuances of that are going to be completely lost on a consumer. So trying to, trying to get the information to, in order to follow it up is one of the challenges. Um, but also a, a lot of the, a lot of the, particularly the banks, don't really know what they should be worried about. And I think that's part of what the registry can do to help them uh, understand that and, and one of the initiatives that we're we're bringing to the registry for um, from January we're doing a trial with the um, 7726 information uh, and I'm sure all the panelists on here know about what 7726 is but it is kind of the best kept secret in mobile um, that it's it's a method that um, where consumers can report um, spam by just forwarding it to the short code um, 7726 um, and if you've got an old Nokia that used to spell spam um, but you know that has that trial that we're starting um, in January we've we've started to get some information through and that's been quite an eye opener even for for you know people like myself who see this kind of stuff all the time because it's highlighted things that nobody really knew that we we should be worried about and an example of that is there's been a, a massive um, uh, uplift in um, the spoofing of five digit short codes, um, which, you know, it's probably been going on for ages, but certainly I wasn't aware of that until I actually started to see some of the redacted information from 7726. And, you know, in one bank's case, we saw over a thousand um, uh, spoofed short codes being used in a 30 day period. Um, so they were cycling short codes and at the same time cycling URLs to try and stay under the radar. But, you know, when you actually present that to the bank and say, here's something you should be frightened of. Uh, and then obviously, you know, if it's, if it's a big problem like that, that's something that we would try and take on with the, the networks to try and resolve. So I think it, it, it is, 
it's not just a question of trying to 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 get them to put their hand up and and, I, and say yes i've got a problem uh one of the biggest problems is actually making them know what they should be worried about because a lot of these people are not messaging experts and you know you've got to remember that a lot of these people that they don't understand their delivery chains either um you know so you know they're sending out thousands and thousands of messages but they don't understand end to end how they're delivered uh, and the amount of hops that take place and all that kind of stuff they don't understand the concept uh, sorry i'm being very scathing of my, my merchants here and i don't mean to be but a lot of them don't a lot of them don't realize that um if you want a quality service and you don't want people to either use gray routes or to to mess with your messaging sometimes you've got to pay a bit more for a premium product um, and you know by insisting by getting procurement teams within some of the banks to to ask the right questions um you know they can help themselves and i think um, certainly this is something that I've actually seen trickling through already with a lot of the government agencies um, and government obviously are you know we want the cheapest no, no question I was about to say that Mike and you beat me to it I think this is going to be a topic of another future webinar in 2021 because price really drives the, the yes, choice think, from, from messaging for so many companies and it shouldn't be the only factor no and i think that's you know we we are within the registry we ask a lot of the aggregator community they do you know they do most of the heavy lifting um uh you know people like infobipira you know and the others they're doing a lot of the heavy lifting to make this work um and they don't get a lot of thanks for it but I think the the, the long-term payoff for those people should be that you know determining that here's someone that's doing everything they possibly can to help prevent fraud in the industry, to actually try and sustain the industry. Because let's face it, you know the banks aren't stupid. If if we don't clean up this problem with it ourselves, then um, we will you know the the banks will will find other solutions for doing their one-time bins and such like. Um, you know, they'll, they'll go somewhere else and it will be the messaging industry's loss if they do that. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a number of things there really that we, by, by making the merchants realise that for a quality product, you've got to pay a little bit more um, is, is key. And, and that's starting to filter through. I mean, I, I've had a couple of um, messaging companies contact me recently and say, we want to be part of the registry. Normally it's the other way around, I'm beating on their door. But they've actually contacted me and said, can we be part of the registry? Because we're bidding for a government contract and there's, there's a box that needs to be ticked to say that we're participating in some of these schemes. So it is filtering through. That's fantastic. Uh, Neil, I know our hour goes so fast, we're nearly closing up on the hour. So I don't want to leave you out of this discussion here with regards to the banks, because I know I think your business services a lot of decent sized banks and financial institutions. Are you seeing them starting to understand more and more the real issues at hand, at hand or are you having to really be the ones to push out and educate? Um, so I, I think partly it's a bit of both, right? So of course, as, as Mojo said, the education is important because a lot of the brands don't realize what they can get from the the operators in terms of data and, and how that can help their their business right but the um, but that education process has been ongoing from myself and other companies like infobip and others for some time now and that is starting to, that message is starting to filter through i think they already see the value of having uh, some kind of anchor points around uh, telephony numbers because you know they are very important as part of our identity and they're very important in markets where people have you know there are uh, so-called thin file individuals like the indias of this world where people don't necessarily have uh, as many bank accounts as they do mobile phone numbers or they haven't had a bank account for as long as they've had a mobile phone number so um, so there's some education, but that process is starting to to bear fruit. I think at the moment it's all about brands looking at how they can take the data that people like myself can bring as part of their existing processes. Um, what's interesting and the, the wave I can see that perhaps is coming in the next 12 months is the the newer challenges in some of these industries 
who were more born in the cloud uh, in nature are doing this much faster than a lot of the traditional big older established brands you beat me to it because we're coming up to the closing point i just want to talk to each one of you so neil yeah. 2021 just around the corner do you think collectively we as an industry the mobile ecosystem as a whole do you think we next year with the current efforts that are being done will be able to protect the average person on the street uh, so will we be able to protect them yes i think we will will we be protecting them uh, i don't believe that that will happen in the large scale mass market sense so i believe by this time next year i think we'll all be talking about some very real uh, use cases that are out there some poster children organizations that are using uh, this information and are out there protecting users and it's working a bit like the the uk sender id scheme is exactly an example of that right it works but it's in the uk and it needs to be adopted in a lot of other places to be 100 percent and so that's where I think we'll be a year from now. Thank you. Mio, your opinion, closing remarks. Where do you think we'll be? Well, what will happen? Yes, I, I will agree with Neil. So uh, uh, I am always looking positive. So, so, I, I will, I will, so for me, uh, the, the 2021 will be like glass half full. And uh, what I would love to see in this year, and, and I'm sure it will happen, that this uh, education curve will finish and start turning into the, uh, the, the first um, real use cases, uh, which will pop up here and there, uh, at least, you know, a couple of in each region, which will help us, you know, even faster driving this uh, in, 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 in those regions. So, um, I, I mean, we are ready. Technically, we are ready. Uh, MNOs are ready. The, there is a need and demand on the market from banks, but as well as other, uh, you know, digital natives so uh, everything is there so i don't see a reason why we shouldn't be able to 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 have like a couple of good uh, cases and examples which will even speed us more toward the future thank you stuart how do we go about educating everyone because it's the mobile network operators the enterprises of course the average consumer on the streets they're all very different target audiences how should us as the industry go about doing this is it through the gsma organizations such as MEF coming out with some basic education, things like that. How would you do it if you were in control of the whole thing? I, th I think the education has to come from the mobile operators themselves. It's really the, right. the, the I mean, literally the contract is with the consumer and the mobile operator, and that's the only person they really trust. Um, you know, we've seen a breakdown in trust of government agencies, um, you know, um, authority in general. Um, what I would say, just a, as a very, very quick comment before we round off, is that um, you know, one thing this this COVID pandemic has done is definitely pushed that digital digitalization agenda further forward. You know, my 75 year old neighbour thinks nothing now of jumping on a Zoom call. Um, necessity is often the mother of invention, and I think in this case, necessity has been the mother of progress. Thank you. No, thank you very much. So, everyone out there, thank you very much for participating in this webinar, as in viewing. I'd like to thank all my panelists: Neil Downing from TNT, Mike Round from the Mobile Ecosystem Forum. Stuart Mitchell from Salusis and Miho Soldine from Infobit. Appreciate you joining us. And who knows, one in one year's time, we may reconvene and talk about exactly where we have actually got through 2021. Have we made some progress? But mobile operators, clearly, from what panelists have been saying, are the key to this. And clearly, there are companies around who are prepared to help educate and assist in many, many ways. So thank you very much, everybody. This is the final official event of the Mobile Ecosystem Forum schedule for 2020. And uh, hopefully I'll be involved in some other things with them next year. So thank you very much indeed. All the best. And if you're having some time off, enjoy. All the best. Thank, thank you. you thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.